Hello, everybody. Welcome to History Valley Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Joanna Kujawa. Welcome to History Valley. Great to be here, Jacob. Uh, history and philosophy are always my two favorite topics, so I'm thrilled to be here. Wonderful. Okay. Um, in 1992, uh, Dr. Joanna earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree at the University of Toronto. And in 1994, she earned a Master's degree at the, at the Pontificum Institute at the University of Toronto in Medieval Studies. And at about the same time, she also earned a Bachelor's of Education degree. This is followed by a PhD in 2005 in Myth Narratives at the University of Monash in Melbourne, Australia. Today, we'll be discussing her book titled the Upper Goddess, Mary Magdalene, and the Goddesses of Eros and Secret Knowledge. It's available on, on websites like Amazon. So you can go ahead, you can just go over there and buy it. The link's in the description, all the relevant information is in the description. Okay, welcome to History Valley again. And today, my first question for you is Do you think in early Christianity that the goddess was more important and then over time? It was overshadowed and removed out from Christianity and later came back in the form of Gnosticism. Thank you, Jacob. Actually, it is a very interesting question. And I, my in short answer was probably, I do not believe so. So because I think, but perhaps, you know, there's another research that, of which I'm not aware at this stage. Having said so, you know, Christianity is different from, you know, uh, other religions that had uh, divine feminine originally and then it was slowly removed or maybe overshadowed right but not in Christianity as far as I know however just to give a little bit of a historical background women who were spiritual women and in Christianity were honored in the first two centuries of Christianity so for example uh, Clement of Alexandria who lived you know roughly around 180 uh, of a common era, he was talking about uh, many women who were philosophers, who were uh, spiritual leaders, and he mentions, especially by name, he mentions uh, Maximilia, I think was from uh, uh, one of the Gnostic groups, and another Marcelina, who was uh, from Carpetation group, Gnostic group, and so on. So there were women who were recognized in early church but perhaps not so much the divine feminine, you know, or the goddess principle. And uh, Elaine Pages, or Pages especially, was looking into it, why, what happened there? You know, why um, uh, women later stopped being acknowledged in early Christian movement? And normally we think that, you know, all bad things happened in the fourth century with the Council of Nicaea, which was a very dramatic event. Uh, however, uh, actually, it seems that it was somehow connected to uh, educational reform in, reforms in the Roman Empire. And in the first, second century, women had more rights, so to speak, and were given education and therefore spiritual education as well, as well was more available to them and were recognized for this. And from second century on, it started to change. So although, for example, Clement of Alexandria is mentioning all of these women and also is saying that women are as spiritually astute as men and so on, he seemed to be an isolated voice. So just to you know, elaborate a little bit on this question more about you know, the goddess principle, uh, the goddess, so to speak, in the person of uh, Virgin Mary, although uh, in the Byzantine Empire, which was the eastern uh, part of the Roman Empire in, with the capital in Constantinople, uh, called the Virgin Mary Theotokos, which basically the mother of God. And she she was worshipped there, right, from the very beginning. And in fact, uh, we know about it at least in 6th century, but it's, you know, relatively late. And also we know that from about 8th to 10th century, in the Byzantine Empire, they had a iconoclastic movement, which was basically people, it was very violent, actually, political movement, when people were clashing uh, on the streets uh, about, you know, whether it is uh, appropriate to represent the images of God or goddess, like here, you know, Theotokos or Virgin Mary, as she was later called uh, in, uh, in, in the icons, you know, so there were iconophiles and iconoclasts who were against it. And apparently some scholars at least believe that it was influenced by 
uh, by Islam. So we know that around 6th century and so on, uh, Virgin Mary was worshipped in the Byzantine Empire in a very strong way, and especially this iconoclastic movement was mostly about whether it is okay to represent her, uh, you know, as a as a divine mother, so to speak. But uh, in Western Europe, you know, it was a little bit different, and uh, the images of uh, the Virgin or Virgin Mary apparently became most uh, obvious and most common around 12th century. And again, some scholars take it back to the Qatar movement, and you know, the Qatars were the heretics which were persecuted uh, by the Catholic Church by Rome, and uh, they didn't think much personally about Virgin Mary because they thought that she was a, a basically a, a vehicle through which Jesus was born, which was. Uh, but they had great regard for Mary Magdalene, which was, you know, of good great interest to me since uh, you know I, I do research about Mary Magdalene, and 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 after um, uh, after that persecution, you know ended, you know, were basically all killed off and burned at the stake, pretty much. You know, the images of the Black Madonna started to pop up uh, all over Western Europe. And the history of Black Madonnas is very interesting in itself because actually they are very often connected to the worship of Isis, much earlier worship of Isis. And in fact, the early images of the Black Madonnas in Western Europe are portrayed exactly with the same symbolism as Isis, which is basically uh, the, the, the mother sitting very straight, like Isis, with uh, the Christ looking really adult, but in a miniature thing, you know, he doesn't really look like a baby, and he's fully dressed like a, like a king, so to speak, and, and they are facing the audience the, exactly the way that uh, Isis and um, Horus were represented. So my uh, argument would be that I'm open, you know, to other <laughs> possibilities, that it was not really, a, a, uh, goddess was not really present in early Christianity. Uh, women were, you know, women were acknowledged in the early Christianity, but I do not see any examples of goddess being worshipped in the way that, for example, in early Judaism, it was Asherah, for example, or, you know, you had, Chokma and so on, uh, not, and then apart from the Gnostics, but not in the kind of, you know, uh, orthodox uh, gospels. That would be my argument. Does it answer your question? Yes. What do you think about um, in the statement in 1 Corinthians that women must not speak in the church, while in Philippians it says that women are, are uh, equally labor alongside men in uh, worshiping Christ? Mm, that's of course I disagree with the first one, and it was bothering me all my life, basically, right? I so and some people believe that it was actually a later insertion. So some scholars believe that it was a later insertion, you know, that women are not allowed to speak in the church. So it would be interesting to check this. And I think it came from um, uh, the discussion within the church itself. Right. So unlike other guests, I think that you interview fantastic guests that you interviewed here who are biblical scholars and they look into, you know, chronology of the Gospels and chronology of the canonical Bible and so on. I am uh, in a way less interested in this because I believe it, it's a compilation of different sources. It's a compilation of different sources. And that's why they are going to be intrinsically, many of them are going to be contradictory. Right. So I do not treat it in a way, kind of fundamentalist way, that this is the truth, you know, and each of them, because then there are so many contradictions, you know, in there. It is basically different people telling stories of their, I would say, spiritual experience and their interpretation uh, of the teachings. And this is how I treat uh, both the Bible and the Gnostic Gospels and other Gnostic writings. So in other words, you don't think... Let's just take, for example, the Gospel of Mark. It was mm -hmm. written as one document. Mm -hmm. It's a compilation of sources. Mm -hmm. So you think virtually each book in the New Testament is a compilation of sources? Well, I don't know if it is, you know, I would make this kind of claim, but but I do believe that different different Gospels obviously were written by different people, right? And okay. it is that personal interpretation or represent interpretation of a group that they represented. 
right? So there are going to be uh, uh, there are going to be uh, some contradictions. And even you know, I believe that we all grow spiritually, right? So even the same author could say one thing at one time and another thing, at, you know, uh, a different time. So that's why I completely do not. Uh, uh, consider them in a way, you know, it is as it is because it says there, you know, it is just interpretation at a certain time, even by the same person. Mm. Because maybe just to clarify it, because my uh, standpoint is a little bit different from, you know, people who do a kind of a chronological and, and linguistic anal analysis of a canonical gospels, which I don't do. I, I let go of this simply because I consider myself apart, you know, from my academic work, a, a, a sincere spiritual seeker. And I started from assumption that, you know, what I was reading there was inconsistent with my spiritual experience, you know, especially as a woman, but generally with my spiritual experience. That's why eventually I started to look for nourishment in esoteric Hinduism and in Gnostic Gospels. So my uh, starting point, point is spiritual experience. And this is how I read the Bible, and this is how I see, you know, different uh, different gospels, or different parts of the Bible that they are just uh, uh, records of someone's interpretation and their own spiritual experiences, not as something that you know, even necessarily true. It was true to them, and true to the times, you know. So, <laughs> of course, women didn't have much voice then, like, so uh, it, it would be also apparent in this text. So I can what is true towards my experience with respect to my spiritual experience. I remember that in the book you said you you were um you talked about that you hadn't really considered the possibility of Mary Madeline traveling to France until recently. Mm -hmm. Well, led to the conclusion that there uh, that there may be more evidence for her having traveled to France than we thought. Yeah, so I didn't because I thought it was such a wild idea, alternative new age idea. But then I was completely unaware of this tradition that is actually Catholic tradition in southern France that is very old and, and that actually people do believe that Mary Magdalene came to southern France and there are churches, quite early churches, Catholic churches in southern France with uh, very you know, vigorous pilgrimages that take place even nowadays. And there are some sources as early as second and third century that, uh, you know, postulate that Mary Magdalene came there. But whether it is just a figment of medieval imagination, because, you know, it would be good for everybody if you could have a piece of a saint, so to speak, or some story about a saint in a given region. Uh, the main source actually come, is quite late. It comes from the 12th century. It is written by a Dominican uh, priest a Dominican uh, priest who wrote the, go uh, the Golden Legend and where he discusses many, you know, uh, saints and so on, including Mary Magdalene, and where he uh, states that, you know, she definitely came to France from Holy Land, as he says, about 15 years after the event of, um, uh, of the crucifixion. And she apparently and some other people, including Lazarus, Sidonius, which is apparently a man who was uh, who was giving his side back by Jesus and some other women that were thrown into a boat and in the Mediterranean Sea and, uh, uh, you know, in the hope that they are going to get lost, but they didn't get lost. And, you know, there's a kind of flamboyant medieval story that... Uh, you know, angels had them and they landed in, in on the shores of Marseille. And then on the shores of Marseille, they were met by a gypsy shamanic woman or a queen. It is not clear. And her name was Sarah, apparently, or Sarah. And she, she welcomed them because she was given a vision that this holy woman from the Holy Land would be coming to the land near Marseille. And from there, uh, it's quite interesting because he kind of, this Dominican monk uh, kind of uh, confirms what the Gnostic Gospels were saying about Mary Magdalene, that she was not only beautiful, but came from a wealthy family and extremely well educated in, uh, in the teachings of a, uh, of, of a teacher. And, and people were, when she started to preaching on the shores of, of um, Marseille, people were amazed by her eloquence and spiritual knowledge. However, she didn't continue preaching, according to the legend, and she went uh, 
uh, to a cave. It's an interesting story, and she apparently meditated and prayed in this cave for 30 years until she died. Interestingly, this, uh, as very often with Christian stories or the goddess stories, uh, uh, the stories overlap. So this cave apparently was also considered a cave, you know, de devoted in pagan times to goddess Artemis. So it's quite interesting that she ended up in the same cave, or it's just elaboration of a more ancient story, like the Black Madonnas and Isis, that I don't know. And interestingly enough, um, interestingly enough, uh, a few years ago, National Geographic took the skull from uh, the church of, I think it's in Saint Maximus in southern France, that you know claim that it, it is a skull of Mary Magdalene, and they did a 3D image, you know, of the skull, and you know, so you can see, you can Google it, and you can see the image of who possibly, you know, how possibly Mary Magdalene looked like if it was Mary Magdalene. And the reason why I actually gave some credence to the story because there is a scholar. Uh, very well established scholar called uh, Anna Fedel, who actually wrote a book uh, looking for Mary Magdalene, which uh, talks about the you know the history of pilgrimage and the current pilgrimages to to, uh, to this Catholic sites in southern France. So I thought, okay, so this is possible because I actually came up with a different possibility in a kind of semi anecdotal way. I was looking what if Mary Magdalene existed and what she would do, you know, uh, after the event of crucifixion and I thought that the best place would be for her to go to Alexandria. So in my book uh, I kind of tried to reconcile it saying okay maybe she went to Alexandria for you know first 15 years and then after 15 years she went to France. Uh, you know so uh, th that's a possibility. If you want me I can elaborate why she I thought she went to Alexandria and we can discuss it later. Yeah I would like that um, but before you do um... My question, a, a question uh, I have about this is: Did she do the? Did she had? Did she travel before or after Jesus was crucified? Oh, this question it it was after. After so they said after, after because they said that you know, uh, you know, disciples apparently were scared for their lives and so on. You know, because if he was crucified, what about us, right? So everybody went somewhere. And apparently 15 years, for some reason it states precisely 15 years after the event of crucifixion, you know, they went to France. So it was after, yeah, definitely after. Okay. So yeah, go, go ahead and, and elaborate on the on the on on it. Uh on Alexandria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's just kind of I treat it like I know when, as a detective story. I know when I, one of your guests, it was a fantastic show, you know, uh, who was about uh, the fatherhood of uh, Jesus, right? Oh yeah. And he said he he did it like a film, and I did it like a detective story in my uh, in my book, The Other Goddess about Mary Magdalene. So, for example, uh, this is how it went. So, uh, Philo of Alexandria, you know, first century. Uh, philosopher whom, you know, anybody who does early Christian studies completely adores, yes. Uh, he, he, in his Vita Contemplativa, he was talking about therapeutai. And therapeutai were called also the healers, but they were also uh, Jewish philosophers and, and spiritual teachers and healers who were kind of cosmopolitan in a way like Philo was. So they were also open apparently to uh, the rights of Isis in Alexandria and so on. However, it says that they did accept uh, women philosophers and uh, spiritually uh, um, astute women as well, right? So I thought oh, that's very interesting because obviously I'm interested in this and I also based this research on another scholar's work, John E. Taylor, who, who you know specializes in Philo of Alexandria. Uh, or at least did uh, some years ago. And, and then uh, she kind of casually mentioned that they were also in contact, close contact, contact with the Essenes in the Holy Land. So it kind of uh, uh, perked my interest because, you know, in some scholars believe that, you know, Jesus uh, was associated somehow with the Essenes in the Holy Land and so could Mary Magdalene as well. Do you believe that? Uh, personally, I'm not sure so, because the Essenes actually, although they have a similar figure of uh, savior, so to speak, uh, apparently he was dated to like 100 years before Jesus. So this is one argument. Hmm. 
So, so this is kind of a, a little bit, you know, uh, we really don't know, right? We really don't know. But for me, the most important part was that they were in contact with different movements. Uh, and nowadays we probably could call it in a very broad way, call them Gnostic movements in the Holy Land. So I just made this kind of leap of faith, you know, as a kind of detective way, right? What if, you know, she could go there, right? Because if I thought if I were Mary Magdalene, you know, I wouldn't go to some, you know, wild place in France. You know, I would go to the Cosmopolitan Center where, you know, there are other Jewish philosophers who accepted women uh, and, you know, and where I could be safe and doing my work, right? So I thought, okay, so what maybe, is there any possibility that she's associative therapeutic? And mind you, I, I'm aware that it is kind of detective, uh, semi-anecdotal sort of uh, evidence. And, and I'll tell you why I, I did it in a moment. So I thought, okay, was there a woman in Alexandria that could fit this kind of description that Mary Magdalene was? And I found, you know, uh, this well-known figure called Mary the Alchemist, Mary, Mary the Jewess, or Mary the Prophetess, who lived in the first century Alexandria, and apparently she specialized in the spiritual form of alchemy. And she was later mentioned in the third century by Zosimus, a famous uh, uh, alchemist from Akmin, who later moved to Alexandria. And uh, another kind of interesting piece to, of a puzzle is that uh, uh, the Gospel of Mary was also found in Akmin. So I was just thinking, you know, uh, maybe there was a tradition there already of, of this woman, you know, who was a prophetess and who they say was either Jewish or partially Jewish, which is another part of the research that I did on this. And that's why she could disseminate the teachings of spiritual alchemy because uh, sort of speak natural born uh, Egyptians were not allowed to do this because of the, uh, you know, Egyptian law imposed by the, um, uh, by the, uh, 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 in Egypt by by uh, religious institutions in Egypt. So I thought, and I thought, okay, so what if she was that? You know, she was definitely according to the Gnostic Gospels, you know, an, an, an intelligent, spiritually astute and educated woman. Uh, and for me, if, if, you know, we can guess such thing and if she was a historical person, Alexandria would be much more interesting place to go than, uh, than France, right? So... I, I just played with this idea. Oh, I had my I've had I've muted myself. Sorry. Okay, oh, that's my, question, my, here. Question, <laughs> okay. my question was um how important was Mary Magdalene to first century and early second century AD Christians in contrast to Jesus? Mm. How important she was a first century Christian. And well, we will never know this because we don't have really any, any records about it, right? So this is what I said. This is just, you know, a, a detective work that uh, I wanted to do. But, you know, in Gnostic Gospels, at least, and Gnostic writings, you know, she's portrayed as the main disciple of Jesus. You know, whether you look at the Gospel of Mary or, you know, you look at Pistis Sophia, for example, uh, she answers 39 or 42 questions to Jesus. And, it, and I know that Gnostics had an agenda there, that it was kind of anti-imperial agenda, and, and I'm aware of this. So they're setting her up perhaps symbolically against Peter, who is considered, you know, the founder of the Catholic Church, so to speak, or the church in Rome. And, and you know, and they considered her basically as a, um, a, a as an alternative to this, you know, as alternative as someone who was more interested in Gnosis, you know, in divine spark, you know, uh, getting rid of ignorance, which... Uh, is very much in, in line with what I believe as a spiritual seeker, you know, and that's why I eventually moved, you know, to, to Hindu, esoteric Hinduism and Gnosticism, rather than starting institutional, institutional religion. So for, for those Gnostic groups who revered Mary Magdalene, she became a symbol of that, you know, somebody who seeks Gnosis and inner knowledge rather than starting institutionalized religion. 
So in this sense, she would be important. But how important and how vast these group, Gnostic groups were, you know, it, it, it remains to be open. I know that you compare Mary Magdalene to Isis. Mm -hmm. Why why compare them? And and if and um, I assume you also compare Jesus to Osiris. Why compare them? And what what are the what are the um, significance? What are the implications of comparing them? Okay, I'm not only comparing Mary Magdalene to Isis. I was just looking for you know I more interested in mythology because, and i'll tell you why than actually looking into history of uh, canonical gospels and i will tell you why because this is partially from what i learned from uh esoteric doing research in esoteric hinduism because there so i'll just make it a little bit of a round trip here because there i learned that especially in esoteric traditions uh, in, in india uh, that there was a strong lineage of women who, you know, nowadays we call them yogini, or this term is really corrupt now in, in modern times, or in uh, early Buddhism, you know, dakinis, who carried an oral tradition, esoteric tradition, in which, you know, they actually believed that, you, so moving closer to our topic, sexuality could be, an, be a part of uh, attaining spiritual, um, uh, spiritual enlightenment in that terms or expansion of consciousness or experiencing of divine consciousness and then I started to ask myself actually when I was in Jerusalem in the Eastern Orthodox Church on the Mount of Olives the Church of Mary Magdalene you know whether whether uh, there is a similar tradition is it is it a possible situation that there was a similar tradition in Europe but it was completely suppressed and recently I listened to a really uh, good talk by a Anglican uh, scholar who was saying that, you know, we lost this kind of vital part of uh, uh, of tradition in Christianity associated with sexuality because we completely kind of took certain things from paganism, you know, and repressed others. So I started to look at the images of early goddesses in Western tradition and, and look for symbolism, you know, do they have similar symbolism to the way Mary Magdalene is being portrayed and Mary Magdalene is portrayed with an egg or Mary Magdalene is portrayed with a hand extended with an egg, with a skull, with broken, broken chains. So I started to look for the same symbolism in other goddesses. So it's not only Isis. I went back, you know, and, and uh, Joseph Campbell wrote a wonderful book, uh, Feminine Divine, which is a compilation of his talks on, on this topic, on goddesses. And he mentioned that, and this is what actually inspired me, that the goddess Nimna, you know, in, in Sumer, uh, was uh, portrayed, how she was portrayed, that she was portrayed sitting, you know, as the main figure next to the tree of what he believes is both tree of life and tree of, uh, uh, of knowledge with an a, a upright serpent behind her and in front of her being a male figure, and she gives him either fruit of life or fruit of knowledge, you know, with her hand extended. And apparently uh, the, the, tr the tree then in this particular uh, mythology and later also Persian mythology also uh, corresponds to um, kind of, um, I use a modern term, portal between death and life. So although there is no story of resurrection with Nimna, there is this portal between death and life, and she's offering the fruit of life. And, and the next goddess, which is maybe uh, two, three hundred years later, Assyrian goddess Nimna, has the story a little bit more elaborated. She is also, you know, portrayed this way. She's portrayed with a, either tree or, uh, or with a reed, represents the tree, which is supposed to be an axis of the world, which is basically it meant the portal between death and life. And she has a story of going, you know, the famous story that is repeated in all mythologies of going uh, into the underworld, being tricked, and then through her own trickery, you know, she manages to resurrect herself, but then her own partner, you know, uh, Tumus or Dumuzi, has to be sacrificed for six months, you know, and go into the underworld, and he can spend six months with her, her lover. So there is a story of resurrection there with a similar symbolism. Then they, I trace the same symbolism, similar symbolism to Isis and Osiris, except that she manages to resurrect her partner and husband only for, you know, short time, just enough to conceive uh, uh, that child, Horus. So it's not only that, you know, it's Osiris 
and, and, and Isis, but there's this long line of goddesses that have a very similar symbolism. And if we can digress a little bit also to uh, Tantric Hinduism, goddesses, for example, such as Kali are also represented with the skull. Uh, goddesses like Sundari, which are also very powerful sexual goddesses, uh, are portrayed, you know, they're dressed in red, like Mary Magdalene. They're portrayed with a skull. They are the portals between death and life. And, and, and there are, you know, and there is some sexual elements to each story, like with Mary Magdalene, or, or I believe in the story of Mary Magdalene, this element was completely corrupt and misrepresented. So I wouldn't say that it is just Isis. I was just looking at Osiris. I would say that there is a was looking for similarities in the line. I was looking for lineage, and I was wondering, is it a something? This mythological story keeps repeating itself. So I don't know if it's something surfacing from a psychological point of view, you know, in our subconscious, you know, to look into this, or is it, you know, actually uh, uh, some element that is being transported from one culture to another, and, and from. Uh, uh, and also through times, you know, the same story repeated with slightly different de details depending on, 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 on the culture. But basically the same story of resurrection, of uh, the goddess being present of the resurrection and being often the um, activator of the resurrection. The resurrection is not possible without her. Like with Isis, it's not possible without her. With Inanna, it's not possible without her. With Nimna, it's not possible without her. But by the time we get to Mary Magdalene, she's just present there, right? She's just present there. And in fact, there is this infamous line in Latin, noni me tangere, which means do not touch me, which very often is represented like, do not touch me, you know, you, you because, you know, you're just this impure woman and so on. And when I read the interpretation, a beautiful interpretation of the Gospel of Mary by Jean-Yves Leloup, uh, or Lelou, actually in French, who, he, who is a former Catholic priest. He's a Coptic scholar and who now, I think, for several years is already an ordained priest in Eastern Orthodox Church, I think in Greek Orthodox Church. And he says that the original in, in Greek basically was not do not touch me, but do not hold on to me. And the rest of the line is because I have not ascended yet. So uh, in this way, you know, Mary Magdalene, it's kind of softened, you know, this kind of badness, supposed badness of Mary Magdalene. However, Mary Magdalene is present. She is even called, even by St. Augustine, you know, the doctor of church who was not a great friend of women at all, you know, the first uh, apostle and so on, because somehow she was necessary, you know, at least as a messenger. When in earlier stories of the same version with the same with the other goddesses, for example, like Inanna or Isis, they were actually the activators of a resurrection, which would not happen without them. So that was the connection between, uh, you know, Isis and Mary Magdalene for me. And the whole story, you know, the whole story of resurrecting the young king. Does Gnosticism conflate Mary Magdalene with uh, Sophia at all? Yeah, or, I hmm. no go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I oh, know maybe finish your question. So well, I was also gonna mention the Virgin Mary mm. um in that context too. Mm. I think that um uh, I have a very ambivalent relationship with Virgin Mary, but probably because of my background, and as probably your viewers can hear also, I am originally from Poland. And I, I was a Catholic for a long time until I, I couldn't anymore because I, and it's just a personal choice, nothing against anyone. It's just that I didn't find any nourishment in the teachings. And because I'm a passionate spiritual seeker, you know, I didn't find any methodology. I didn't, explanations didn't make sense to me. So I grew up with the images of Virgin Mary and, you know, I used to put flowers under her paintings and icons and so on, but I, I eventually started to rebel against it you know this this impossible concept you know of, of this 
virgin mother often associated especially in culture from which i come with suffering and and also sacrifice and i thought like you know i think i can make other choices in my life and i'm not into sacrifice and suffering simply because i'm a woman so almost automatically i started to be interested in the other uh, archetype that i would say of a goddess that was available to me in this religion which was you know the archetype of mary magdalene which seemed to be a much more interesting woman so I think just to very broadly answer your question that uh, Mary Magdalene was sometimes conflated with Sophia, you know, because she she was sometimes called, you know, uh, the Sophia of Jesus or or um, the provider of wisdom. In a way, I would say that we both know, I think, Miguel Conner of Eon by Gnostic Radio. And once when I interviewed him, he, he said this fantastic thing, very Miguel, Miguel Conner. He says that Mary Magdalene and Jesus Christ are like the Beatles and, and Helen of Ty and Simon the Magician or Simon Magus or Magus, depends how we pronounce it in Latin or in English, you know, like the Rolling Stones. And, and so it means like the more radical version of the same couple, so to speak. And, and uh, there are arguments also that, you know, maybe Simon Magus was Jesus and Jesus was Simon Magus. It's just that, you know, he was, the, the, the other couple, the parallel couple was considered too, too, too radical, so to speak. And definitely, you know, Gnostics did believe that um, uh, Helen, you know, and Simon believed that Helen, you know, was... Uh, like the fallen Sophia, and and you know he saved her, and and uh, she was the knowledge provider. And I think it's a wonderful story. The whole story of Sophia is wonderful. Of that explains really, uh, perhaps the journey of human soul. You know, when uh, just just to summarize it, you know, when she's attracted to something below, up in this other dimensions, in the heavens, right, to the own reflection, maybe of a creator. And she falls, and once she falls, she forgets who she is, and she starts to prostitute herself until you know. Uh, it depends what story, right? Simon or Jesus, you know, or Christ consciousness descends to you know to save her, and and a part of her stays below uh, to to help us on our journeys, and the other part goes back to you know where she originally belongs. So it's a beautiful story, and I think that perhaps there was some effort made to equate uh, Mary Magdalene with Sophia, although it probably fits better the uh, story of Helen of Tyre mm. and, and Simon. But I like that comparison between Sophia and Mary Magdalene because I think it, uh, it, it honors the fact that in, she, uh, at least to some Gnostic Gospels, you know, was educated woman, that she was a favorite disciple by Jesus, you know, and the famous lines from the Gospel of Mary, you know, uh, teacher, why do you love her more than us? Or maybe teacher, why do you prefer her more than us? And so on. And the Peter constantly objecting, you know, why do you even speak to this woman of things that you didn't speak to us? And broadly speaking, Gnostics also believed that uh, Jesus gave three levels of teachings, one to the ones that are included in the canonical Bible, which Bible, which basically means the basic teachings of the parables of the Bible and so on for the fishermen around the Sea of Galilee which is a beautiful place and uh, and uh, you know second teachings to his disciples you know who are spirit more had, had the benefit of being around him and his energy and the third level of teachings to his beloved disciples and some people argue it was Mary Magdalene and some people believe that it was John some people believe it was both we have a super chat question B bear thank you for the 10 Australian dollars where did the idea that she was a prostitute come from? Earlier cultures have a tradition of temple prostitutes, such as with Enkidu. Could this be related? Okay, so that's a fantastic question. Thank you, Biber. So there are a couple of answers that I can give to this. So um, first, I'll start where the idea that she was a prostitute came from. I'll start with uh, most recent times. And by most recent, it's before pagan times. So I think that there are two reasons. Uh, in the Christian tradition. The first one, it is, it was in uh, 591, Pope Gregory the uh, first, okay, I'm going to say, made a scriptural mi mistake and basically said in homily 33 that Mary Magdalene is the woman sinner, you know, that was a 
prostitute and so on. However, there is no evidence for this because actually the word, even if she was this woman, Sine, it was in Greek, Hermatalos, which means basically somebody who broke uh, Jewish law. It has nothing to do with prostitution and was never used with uh, respect to, you know, to de denotate a prostitution. In uh, the word that, you know, prostitute, there's, there's a word pouring and it was not once used in the Bible. Another reason could be that there was, a, and you know, and we are talking about medieval imagination and things get conflated a little bit, right? So it didn't have to be even uh, mean, so to speak, or intentional, although we know that by that time there was so much misogyny. And it, it, even earlier, I think it was Tertullian who was saying these vicious vipers, you know, that they think that they're equal to women and can preach and so on. So, you know, misogyny was uh, very early on. So it, I, I don't know. I just say that, you know, he started it in the sixth century. So it's quite late to become a prostitute. Yeah. After five centuries or six centuries, another reason could be that there was a, a Christian saint, early medieval Christian saint called Mary of Egypt. So, you know, just to make it more confusing, who was in fact a prostitute and who, according to the legend, heard the teachings of Jesus and gave up prostitution and went to the Holy Land and became and became, you know, like an ascetic woman and, you know, follow the teachings and so on. So it could be that something happened in this medieval, you know, imagination and that they didn't, they are not big on facts either, right? And they conflated the two Marys, Mary of Egypt, and there is some evidence that Mary might have had some connection with Egypt, right? With the other Mary, which came four centuries later, Mary, um, Mary of Egypt, which is the actual saint. And it happened quite often with several early saints in, 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 in not so early even in, in the Catholic Church. Another one that I really like when you talk about, you know, the, the what is it called, holy prostitute or, you know, and so on. And in fact, there was a tradition coming from Sumer and Assyria when the priestesses, including in the priestesses of the Temple of Inanna, you know, they would have what I would call tantric sex with chosen men. To, uh, uh, for the sake of, you know, community, basically, you know, to increase the fertility of the, um, of the crops, so to speak. So there was this tradition. And, uh, for example, we know of one, uh, uh, although I wouldn't call them holy prostitutes, I think it's already misogynist because it's not prostitute. They're, you know, they're priestesses. And in that culture, you know, they're doing service to community, so to speak. Uh, but And it was not, you know, prostituting yourself with anyone, but with chosen men doing ritualistic sex, which I call sexual alchemy. So it wasn't like of anyone. It's not like I'll come to the temple and have some fun. It was not like that. So, uh, and we know of one Enwenada, or Enwenada, I don't know if H is silent or not, who actually we have um, great, good research about her. She was a, uh, she was a daughter of a king who, who became a high priestess. Uh, and she wrote a series of beautiful poems to, to goddess Inanna and who, who, and who did participate in the ritualistic sex with chosen men, you know, and it, as I said, it was not, uh, uh, it, it was not in, in a way, let's say casual or just, uh, or anything like that, that uh, beautiful, very erotic, uh, very erotic poems. And I, I have some of them in my book, which are, you know, gorgeous poems, very sexual, very erotic and, 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 uh, and very beautiful at the same time. There is nothing um, mm. ugly, you know, or dirty or sleazy about it. So I think this in itself testifies to the fact that, you know, uh, how, how this was done. So definitely, and I certainly hope so, that there was a sexual element to this, that, uh, that, that there were ritual, sexual rituals as they exist also until this day in the tantric traditions of esoteric uh, uh, esoteric Hinduism, so it's definitely something to this. So I would say that apart from the tradition, which I think was misrepresented about the holy prostitute, and I believe that we are talking about trained priestesses, both you know in temples of Inanna and Isis, who have ritualistic sex with chosen men, uh, and also from the fact that. Uh, there was Mary of Egypt who was a prostitute, according to the legend, and then moved to the 
Holy Land, but it was fourth century. And then the Pope Gregory I in 591 in homily 33 uh, said what he said without any base, basically. I hope it answers your question. It does. Robert Herring, thank you for the $2. Is that Tantra the basis for the great marriage? By, by great, because it's it put great marriage, you mean uh, heroes gamos, or do you mean like marriage between two people? I just wonder here. Unfortunately, because, he's not specific in this super chat. Okay, I so know. maybe I will, um, so I will answer it in two ways. So, okay, so if we talk about heroes gamos, then tantra could be the base of heroes gamos, right? Because it is basically what I call in the other goddess, you know, sexual alchemy, which means ritualistic. Uh, sex for the purpose of expansion of consciousness. So definitely, if we talk about great marriage between couples, in a classical tantra that I studied and was initiated to, and in works that, you know, I mind you, I'm talking about one particular tradition and there are many tr tantric traditions. Uh, so I'm talking about tradition that uh, from Kashmir Shaivism, you know, and the philosopher Abhinavagupta from 10th century and his work Tantra Loka and chapter 29 of Tranta Loka that actually talks about it, you know, and gives a specific uh, uh, descriptions and to which I, you know, I was initiated and the document that I started, studied for a year and a half uh, is, is not, okay? So it's not for great manage. This is not to improve anybody's sexual life. It is about strictly for ritualistic reasons to expand your consciousness. That does not mean that it cannot be lustful. That doesn't mean that it's not sexy. I don't want to bring this impression that, you know, it has to be holier than thou, no. But in this specific tradition that I studied, it has to be done without attachment to the person. So it can be done. It doesn't say that it cannot be done in couples. But it would be more difficult because, you know, in couples, there's more baggage, there's emotional connection and so on. And, and there may be a desire to repeat the experience itself. When uh, in this tradition, the partners are chosen by the attained spiritual teacher, like, for example, Abhinava Gupta, and two people are chosen who are deemed to understand that this is, you know, the sexual experience is done in a particular way for the purpose of expansion of consciousness to divine to to experience Christ consciousness or in tantra it would be cosmic consciousness or Shiva consciousness in this particular tradition and not to improve your your marriage right so but technically speaking it could be done within uh, a couple as long as the couple understands what it is about um Okay, so Robert Herring, thank you for that $2 super chat again. Um, what finally put an end to the view that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute? What? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it properly. What put an end to the view that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute? Okay, so the uh, end. So actually, I think it was exactly in 1969. I hope I'm not getting my deck dates mixed up, but late 60s, I think 1969, for example, the Catholic Church did admit that it was a scriptural uh, mix-up by Gregory I, and that actually there's no evidence for this. So that's one of the things that could be. And also, I think the rest has to do also with, uh, you know, the modern scholarships and uh, scholarship and, and also the discovery of Nag, Nag Hammadi and even earlier, you know, the discovery of the Gospel of Mary, although it was not translated for a very long time, as you know, uh, not until 1950s, I believe, and the first translations were, you know, unreadable. Uh, so uh, when people started to question this, you know, how come this woman could be this? Because in other sources, it's not mentioned that she was this, you know, and, 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 and so uh, I think that, you know, modern scholarship plus you know, even the Catholic Church admitted that actually there's no basis for this. Although I think that not enough effort was done to, to explain to this, because if you talk to a very average Catholic, even if I talk to my family, you know, who are still Catholic uh, back in Poland, they would, uh, they, they still think, oh, this is, oh, we read some of it, Mary Magdalene is not <laughs> a prostitute, and, 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 but it's news to them, right? So I think it's modern scholarship mm -hmm. and and, and and maybe the admission of a church as well. 
final question. Um, in the book, you mentioned that some date the Gospels as late as 150 AD. Mm -hmm. When I, I know mm -hmm. it's not your, I know, as you said during the stream, it's not your forte necessarily, mm -hmm. but I'm just curious if you don't mind answering. When do mm -hmm. you personally think the four Gospels were written? Well, you know, it it is a little bit like the Gnostic, like with the Gnostic Gospels, that depends which scholar you refer to, right? And probably right. You, you probably interviewed most of them by now, right? So each of them has a different dating. So oh, whether yeah, it's canon, uh, in different dating, whether it's a canonical Gospels or you know, or, or, or Gnostic Gospels. But I think uh, basically the earliest ever. I think people say around uh, earliest is seventies, right? It is yeah. early the seventies. Or well, there are some uh, uh, scholars that say that, and, and we know that the actual disciples, of course, didn't re re write the gospels. Although there are some scholars that maintain that John, who lived such a long time, apparently ninety plus, that his disciple he dictated it to his disciple the Gospel of John, which actually was the last one to be accepted in the canonical Bible because it was nearly considered heretical or, or gnostic, but you know at the end it was accepted, doomed as you know okay. So, uh, but as I said, from it really depends who you talk about, and there is this I think unnecessary argument between the canonical scholars of canonical gospels and gnostic gospels because I personally reach a conclusion, but I'm talking like not as a scholar but as a spiritual seeker, you know, and I try to prioritize this part in my life at this stage of my life is that you know we treat. Uh, as Jean Yves Le Loup says in his uh, interpretation of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, he says that, you know, we should take them together. And I had another conversation recently with another scholar, Celine Lilly, who specializes also in some Gnostic uh, gospel, uh, uh, Gospels, but also, you know, is a, is a, a scholar of, canon of, early of, um, uh, of canonical Gospels. Uh, that we should treat them, and we agreed we should treat them the same, basically, because from a spiritual point of view, these are gifts of the spirit, so to speak. People who, uh, you know, interpreted and maybe knew or had contact with the teacher or, you know, spiritual teacher, and this is how I treat Jesus personally, you know, or people who are around him. And, you know, th these are their interpretations of this, of this contact or this understanding of this. And some people have different interpretations. And from a spiritual point of view, it really doesn't matter which one is the first, because the, we, the, what is really important, if you don't, you know, if you're not fundamentalist, which brings more spiritual truth for you. You know, which mm -hmm. helps you to explain your spiritual experience because we can, and I know I completely appreciate it because I declined this kind of career, you know, uh, what we are talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Which I could have followed, you know, because from a spiritual point of view, we can, okay, from a, schol a scholarly point of view, we can argue forever who did what, who was first, which are more legitimate. But from spiritual point of view, it is which one gives you nourishment, which one helps you to explain your spiritual experience. Right, and uh, for me, this is much more important than uh, than dating. Personally, mm -hmm. so I don't. So it's kind of a, maybe different answer that you expected. But as I said, eventually uh, we have to stop arguing. And you know, it's interesting. It's a little bit detective game from a, schol a scholastic and scholarly point of view. But what enriches your spiritual experience? And I think it was uh, William James who. I hope I'm not misquoting here, if I remember correctly, because I wrote a paper about it like seven years ago, you know, who said that, and I think most people probably would agree with this, you know, that all religious or great spiritual, I prefer to say spiritual movements started by a great spiritual teacher, right? Someone who had access, you know, who had a easier access, you know, to the consciousness, divine consciousness, to use this kind of terminology for the lack of a better word, and, and they were like white hot. He calls them white hot. But very often and most of the time, they didn't leave any, any scriptures behind them. And the disciples of our disciples started to, and it goes for every tradition, started to write down things. And then they started to, you know, leave out certain things because, you know, they were not considered, you know, radical or weird or not consistent or, you know, uh, they couldn't understand them. So they leave them out and so on. And then in the more institutionalized it is, the less truth it carries. And I, it's my personal, and I agree with this, 
that's why I wrote the paper about it. But my my personal opinion here is that I absolutely agree with this, that the more institutionalized something is, the more mainstream a spiritual movement becomes, then it becomes a religion, and very often then it becomes a source of oppression rather than a source of liberation. So going back here to Mary Magdalene, for example, how do you read this images. So Mary Magdalene is very often portrayed with her chains being broken by her feet. And a traditional uh, explanation it is, you know, because she was a prostitute and prostitute was, you know, uh, with chains and oils. And this is what actually Gregory the first in sixth century completely misunderstood. Oils, she probably used it for some, you know, kinky stuff, right? So that's why therefore she was a sinner. When in fact, you know, she was doing the anointment uh, ceremony, right? And the broken oil, broken... Uh, chains represent liberation, right? And I think that this is a great tragedy, you know, about what happens to, te to the teachings of every great spiritual beings who came here, including Jesus, you know, but I'm being inclusive of others, right? Of other tradition, any spiritual tradition, who come here to give us teachings and who come here to give us spiritual tools so we can attain the, the way that Gnostics, some Gnostic schools believe, attain actually the same level of spiritual development that they did, or, you know, or close enough. But I believe we are all capable of this. And then people who come after them start to institutionalize it, turn it into religion and a form of oppression, or at least limitation, if not oppression. So, uh, so I, I think that that's why I love. I got interested in esoteric Tantra, but I also, through esoteric Tantra, found Gnostic Gospels, you know, and I truly believe that the Gnostics, you know, just felt it in their bones that what's going on is wrong. Although there were no angels, you know, because I, they wrote some misogynistic stuff in some of our works and so on. They were the children of our age as well, right? So, however, at the same time, they felt it in their bones that what's going on is just mainstreaming teachings, you know, and then modifying teachings, you know, just for the purpose of making it a state religion, right? And this is what happened to Christianity for sure, I believe. Well, thanks for joining me. And I do want, uh, and I would like to have you um, back at some point. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. I hope that I answered the questions the best I could. And I said my uh, some of the answers came uh, mostly from me as a spiritual seeker. At the same time, I did check my sources, you know, because I still, you know, have uh, keep my scholarly heart as I am searching for the answers. Thanks again. Thank you. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.